Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Vitaly Wool, and um, today I'm going to talk a little bit about edge computing with the RISC-V platforms uh, and how it all goes together with uh, running Linux and uh, specifically Linux that has XIP technology enabled. Sorry. Let me move it a little bit further down. So I was supposed uh, to have a co-speaker, Maria Wall. Um, unfortunately, it looks like uh, she won't be able to come over and participate and show the demo because um, we have a problem with the babysitter. You know, we we came here, um, uh, we uh, hired a babysitter, but uh, she is stuck in a traffic jam. Uh, things like that happen. Uh, on the other hand, uh, what, what I can, uh, I mean, you probably should be upset not seeing Marie here. Uh, I can promise that if that talk gets accepted uh, to ELC Europe, hello Tim, if that talk gets accepted to ELC Europe, I absolutely promise that she will be giving it and I will be st sitting with the kids. I mean, we, we have all the equality stuff, we're coming from Sweden, you know, where we are. Like. So. Maria isn't, uh, you know, exactly a software developer. She's a photographer and uh, she's a video engineer. Uh, and eventually she started off doing QA for Consulco Group, for Consulco AB. And this is uh, how she came into this picture and this presentation. And uh, she did help with uh, setting up the demo and you know running it. Uh, so I will not be talking too much about it, you know. But you'll see Europe, you know. We'll look forward to that. And she is currently living in Malmo, Sweden, as much as I do. Uh, even though I have more embedded background and. Uh, uh, I've been doing embedded stuff since 2003, actually working for, for Mona Vista and then for Embedded Alley and, you know, um, massive number of Swedish companies when I w went to Sweden, moved to Sweden in 2009. Uh, so now I'm running um, Consulco AB, a Swedish subsidiary of Consulco Group, uh, which is like a global company with a headquarters somewhere in the Bay Area. I think it's San Jose, but, you know, who cares about that, especially after the uh, COVID times, you know. No one cares where their office is. So this presentation, uh, I will briefly give an overview of RISC-V and you know what it is architecture-wise and where we stand with that. And some, uh, I'll I'll absolutely talk. Um, hopefully not too much about XIP and Linux XIP because this is one of my favorite subjects. This is one of my, you know points of interest, uh, and then um, we'll cover a little bit uh, edge computing and why RISC-V and edge computing uh, go well together, uh, and, and then we pass over uh, to XIP and Linux and how all those things, you know, mm, form a perfect circle as if, you know, you're... Uh, trying to solve a puzzle, and, and this is the solution to the puzzle. This is the answer. So optimistically, we'll get to that. Um, so risk five, risk five, what it is and what it is not. Uh, so it's the instruction set architecture, and it's open source, and this is to, to a huge extent, uh, it's... Uh, main advantage because it's royalty free and you can actually create anything uh, based on the instruction set architecture that is specified by RISC-V specification and mm, that is especially important when you're working on some kind of uh, design that is supposed to be low cost and this this is something, this is one of the keywords. Uh, 
we are looking for a low cost design. We are um, thinking about low cost design and since you know we're going to talk about edge computing, uh, this is IoT, so we're looking uh, at some kind of low cost design for an IoT device or a set of IoT devices. And uh, since it's a risk architecture uh, and command-wise, it's actually pretty similar to ARM. Uh, it's absolutely unavoidable. People are comparing RISC-V with ARM, and, and I'm comparing RISC-V with ARM. So I put together a table um, where such comparison is done uh, with some specific stress uh, for, for XIP, even though I haven't really told you guys what XIP is, but maybe you already know. Who knows what XIP stands for? Oh, Tim, I can imagine that. Okay, anyone else? No. Um, we'll absolutely cover this. Um, sorry, it, it, it can be a deficiency of my slide. Anyway. Uh, yeah, we'll get to what XIP stands for, uh, but we can cover the rest of the table and we can go back to XIP later. So RISC-V, well, it's pretty similar to ARM as, as, as you see. And since RISC-V is an emerging standard, it's an emerging architecture, the fact that, as you can see from, from the table, that uh, the 128-bit uh, is not supported, well, you know, eventually it will be. And then ARM is uh, a well-established architecture with a well-established community, and risc is an emerging architecture, and the community is not so well-established yet. Uh, but the good thing about risc V is that it's free in open-source ICA as opposed to ARM, and that is that is very important. I mean, well, money is important, right? Uh, so if you're looking into creating an IoT design, you probably want to save some money on those, you know, small devices. You don't want to pay royalties. And, and then um, if you go for risk 5 uh, then you also want to have mm, some kind of certainty that this whole thing is going to fly and... Uh, you know, later in the slides, uh, we will show how it can actually be made to fly. So um, we're not going to cover the, the rest of the table with XIP. Uh, we'll go back to that later. Uh, we'll first try to cover what XIP in a nutshell is. So XIP is a technology... Uh, which uh, deciphers itself as execute in place. And that actually means exactly what it says. So the code is executed directly from persistent storage. The persistent storage, the flash, uh, you know, it should allow this execution. So it's basically an OR flash, even, uh, even though now we have... Um, quite fast QSPI NOR flash. It used to be just a standard slow NOR flash back in the days. So we don't have to copy the code to RAM to execute it. And this, this is a significant advantage in a sense because we're saving times on copy uh, and we're saving RAM itself. We don't need to spend that much memory uh, basically in vain, uh, to, to copy the executable code and get it executed from RAM. But it comes at a certain price, like uh, you, you cannot change anything. It's, it's, uh, it's an OR flash. Uh, it can only, it is linear. It can only uh, serve as, an, as a media to, uh, to execute from. Uh, in read-only mode, so that said, you cannot modify the code that you flashed, right? 
So everything should be resolved at compile time. So you should be uh, pretty aware and pretty cautious uh, when you actually uh, build uh, an XIP application or XIP kernel or XIP ex user space for that matter. Uh, and since we're talking about XIP applications, um, it's actually more common for real-time operating systems where you have um, a certain blob, a, a complete application, no separation between kernel user space, applications, you know, whatever. Uh, it comes as a, single, as a single binary and it's flashed to an or flash as a single binary and it's executed. Uh, and for instance, you know, Zephyr does that, right? Uh, so if you develop a Zephyr application, it can be XIP and then you have everything in one application, you flash it to NOR flash uh, and all the addresses, all the stuff is resolved at compile time and then you flash it and you run it. It's a bit more complicated uh, when it comes to XIP on Linux because uh, we absolutely do have the distinguishment between kernel space and user space and kernel should be a separate binary basically and user space the separate file system um, so when it comes to XIP on Linux uh, we mostly uh, first of all uh, think about kernel XIP so the the kernel that can be executed directly from a NOR flash. And uh, kernel XIP is currently uh, supported for just a few platforms. And uh, historically, the first platform to support XIP was ARM 32-bit. And it goes back like more than 10 years, maybe 15 years, I don't remember. Uh, most of the work was done by Nicholas Petri. Um, and at the time, there was no ARM64, and then ARM64 came in, but there's still uh, no kernel XIP support for ARM64. And then there's RISC-V, and we do have kernel XIP support for RISC-V, uh, not for all RISC-V platforms, so they, they the support that has been merged in 5.13, uh, as it says in the slides, that support is currently limited to MMU-enabled uh, RISC-V 64-bit targets. Uh, but the work is ongoing for other targets as well, but still, uh, it's RISC-V 64 MMU-enabled, and uh, you know, we were doing a lot of things uh, to get this merged and there was uh, another guy uh, from the risk community Alexander Gitti who helped a lot as well so uh, XIP uh, is not supported for all uh, targets that run Linux for instance x86 does not support it uh, but still we are mostly concerned about risk 5 and it's supported for risk 5 and the support is in the main line. Uh, it's not supported for uh, the MMU less risk 5, at least in the main line, but uh, there is a work that we've been doing. Uh, so that support is there, but it's just not merged. Uh, and then going over to user space, there's nothing that prevents user space to be uh, execute as place, execute in place as well. So basically it's the same idea as with the kernel. Uh, if the file system, well, it has to be a special file system like CRMFS or AXFS, or, well, there was a work for SquashFS to enable XIP for SquashFS. I think the patches are somewhere out there on the internet, on GitHub or something. Uh, I don't think uh, they ever made its way into the mainline for 
uh, squashy fast, but still it's possible to find them and use them. Uh, however, anyway, uh, it requires a special file system, uh, but the idea is very much the same. Um, you need to have executable sections uncompressed uh, because CRMFS, for instance, is a compressed file system. It compresses uh, the data that it stores. But uh, with a special markup, like this is an executable section. You should not compress it with a special markup. It's possible to use CRMFS, for instance, uh, for XIP where uh, the executable sections of uh, binaries that are to be executed uh, are not compressed, and then you can basically run the code directly from Flash, uh, while mm, the data sections will be copied to RAM because they have to be modified. So if we um, take a uh, short look um, at the standard kernel loading scheme. Uh, then we first have a bootloader which initializes RAM and then we have kernel code that is compressed. And you can see in the picture that uh, on the NAND flash, which is to the left, uh, the kernel code is smaller in size uh, than uh, in RAM, which is pictured on the right. So a bootloader would uh, decompress and copy the decompressed kernel code into RAM and same basically goes for kernel data and then it will pass over the execution to the kernel code which is already in RAM and that is it is a fine scheme as good as any uh, just as a side note we can see that a lot of RAM is occupied uh, by kernel code and kernel data uh, while on the other hand, uh, those things being compressed are not really occupying that much of the NAND flash. And if we move over to XIP operation, uh, specifically kernel XIP, then we don't copy code anywhere. And in the very uh, first, in the very simple case, we don't use compression over data, so data is just copied as is to RAM uh, because this is a prerequisite that it has to be copied to, copied to RAM because you know, we have to modify it. Uh, and then the code stays in NOR flash, and so we can see that with the kernel XIP operation, most of RAM uh, stays available, uh, while on the other hand, uh, we need to have a lot of, or, well, maybe not a lot of, but quite some NOR flash to use. Uh, and finally, mm, if we also deploy um, the user space XIP, then we have to use even more NOR flash. But on the other hand, we still have uh, a lot of free space in RAM that one can use for something else. Or if we're very scarce on RAM, or if we don't have any DRAM, which is, well, I think I'm moving forward too fast, but still, uh, we are looking at IoT targets, first of all, and those IoT targets, uh, for instance, the RISC-V platforms that we use, they don't have any DRAM, uh, they do have SRAM, which uh, is usually 4 or 8 megabytes in size. Uh, and I'll show you, we can get away with 8 megabytes easily if we use kernel user space XIP. Uh, and that would not be possible if we didn't. So that's why. Okay, risk advantages. This is just a summary slide. Um, the obvious advantage is that we are saving on RAM, and as I've said, we can even get away without uh, having DRAM uh, for, for Linux, which is quite nice. You normally are uh, not going to, to have that uh, if you don't use XIP. 
and also there is lower uh, idle power consumption and you now when I'm saying lower I mean that and when I say lower idle power consumption I mean sometimes it can go almost all the way to zero because if you don't have DRAM uh, then you don't have to run self-refresh so the values for idle power consumption are on par with uh, very small systems running real-time operating systems and that is very nice for a Linux system right um, shorter boot time if we have if we have the NOR flash which is fast enough then we're gonna save on uh, the fact that we're not copying anything or well, not anything we're not copying much to ROM uh, so we don't copy the code we don't um, run decompression uh, and then again if we have if you have QSPI flash that is fast enough uh, we can even gain on the faster execution uh, compared to some RAM that is not so fast I mean it will be slower compared to I know running it on the DDR4 but once again we're talking about uh, IOT devices uh, battery powered primarily you know low-cost IOT devices and they will not be DDR4 on low-cost IOT devices okay risk 5 and edge computing let's take a few steps back and go back to to the table so um, uh, I've mentioned it a little bit just you know passing by but since uh, since this is important uh, I would like to draw your attention to uh, to this table and um, you know since we are uh, looking into IOT and small devices and low cost uh, those will be uh, devices without MMU without memory management unit uh, so it's mainly concerning uh, the, the two uh, lower uh, rows of this table and we can see that for risk 5 it says in progress for 32-bit and it's merged in ARM for 64-bit it's ready but not merged it will be merged eventually I'm absolutely sure and 64-bit uh, uh, MMU less devices are not supported uh, hip XIP wise uh, on ARM uh, so if if we are to, to make a choice here between ARM and RISC-V for an IoT device, MMU-less, um, and have it run Linux, and that essentially pretty much means using XIP, uh, then we will either have to go for 32-bit ARM or for 64-bit RISC-V, and 64-bit RISC-V would be preferential for edge computing but we're not we're not quite there but you know 64 is better than 32 uh, and for edge computing we do need some computational power so uh, as you might see there, there are there are some bits and pieces of the puzzle that are you know getting together already right so so edge computing uh, you know when we talk about edge computing uh, we do mean IOT so it's just it's just IOT which is not uh, the very traditional IOT as we think of it uh, where we have a bunch of absolutely dumb devices that just you know send the data up in the cloud and, and get some responses uh, some instructions what to do next edge computing extends the traditional IoT model uh, by uh, moving some of the computations uh, moving some of the intelligence uh, closer to the edge well that being those devices themselves and it reduces volumes of data to be moved uh, in between the devices and the cloud and it allows for better utilization of 
computational powers of those small devices, the IoT devices that we have. And finally, and this is probably the most important thing, uh, it enables uh, AI and intelligent IoT where the connection is weak or intermittent or unstable so that we can't really transfer large amounts of data uh, from IoT devices to the cloud and back. So um, why risk 5 when I talk about edge computing? Why risk 5? Um, risk 5 has relatively high computational power um, for their MCUs um, and combine that with relative low cost. And then again, uh, as we talked earlier, uh, the hardware design is open source. Uh, there are no royalties, there are no fees, so you can design whatever you want or use some existing designs and still you don't have to pay for that. Uh, on the flip side of that, you know, Risk Five architecture, it support in many real-time operating systems is still somewhat lacking, as opposed to Linux, where Risk Five support is still not exactly on par with ARM, but I would define it as advanced, not ideal, not super usable, but it's at advanced stage. Um, and then edge computing applications are relatively complicated. That's that there's, there's a bunch of code to be executed. Um, there are some computations, uh, some intelligence needed. And if we have, I mean, if we are to go for a real-time operating system for our edge computing design on the RISC-V, we might be into trouble uh, because uh, the support in some real-time operating systems is not exactly at the production level, as I've said. Uh, and then it gets harder to debug, you know, all those intelligent things. That they're harder to debug uh, in this traditional single app RTOS environment. So we might want to go for real-time operating systems um, for risk five, but it's better not. It's better to go for Linux if we can deploy Linux. Um, and then uh, this is where XIP is coming into play. Because Linux support for RISC-V MCUs, Linux support for RISC-V uh, is quite good basically for both MMU enabled and MMU less designs. Uh, and and we can, yeah, we can trust it. We can rely on that. Uh, and even though, as I've said, mm, risk five user space for non MU targets uh, is still somewhat shaking. Uh, still, I mean, well, if you have the kernel loading, you can resolve user space issues. So. Um, the bottom line is it's tempting to run Linux on RISC-V MCUs for IoT uh, because we get faster development and easier debugging and shorter time to market. Uh, but if we just plainly do it um, with the mainline kernel and not using uh, any tricks like XIP, uh, then we might end up uh, having a design that is unnecessarily expensive compared to what we could have had because traditional Linux requires a lot of RAM to run and is generally more power hungry uh, than uh, real-time operating system. So we might end up having more RAM uh, and a bigger battery, which is like not very nice. Uh, and if we do it like this, then we might kill the main advantage of RISC-V over ARM de design because the money that uh, we have spared on, on not uh, paying royalties uh, will be just you know, spent on battery uh, and extra RAM. 
And once again, this is where XIP is coming into play uh, to fill in uh, the last gap in the puzzle. Um, so, as I've said, XIP allows for significant to drastic RAM reduction, uh, and it allows for almost zero power consumption in idle mode. And finally, which is very nice, um, and this is where this uh, time to market statement comes from, XIP technology is transparent for application development. That said, you can develop an application in an ordinary Linux environment, and, and then almost transparently, almost painlessly, uh, transfer it to this XIP environment, which you wouldn't be able to do if you do it uh, for uh, a real-time operating system. So, okay, real-life example. Um, there, was a, um, there was a test project um, down there in Sweden for for the cameras for that that do um, uh, license plate recognition for for people that break speeding limits. I know this is not the most popular application out there. Um, on the flip side of that, it's just a test project, so. Uh, there still are no fines uh, associated with this project specifically. Um, but anyway, uh, image capture and recognition. So Max Duino is a RISC-V board with uh, an MCU, which is 64-bit, and it has floating-point unit, and it has uh, 8 megabytes of SRAM, and it has 8 megabytes of NOR flash. And then we used uh, Linux kernel 515 plus our patches and build a based user space. And we, we did a, an attempt to, to, run, uh, to run that without XIP. Um, and in that case, the kernel which would be compressed uh, consumed uh, 400k in flash um, and slightly more than one meg in RAM after having been uncompressed. Uh, the root file system containing the very basics uh, consumed 500k in flash and then in RAM. Well, it depended uh, on the way of usage. It's really hard to estimate, but once again, depending on the usage and the moment, uh, it was one to four megabytes. And then we had this application with the recognition and everything, and it consumed like 500k in flash, and somewhere around to make a little bit less than that in RAM. And you can see that uh, with those numbers, uh, we do have a trouble uh, fitting all this stuff uh, in the SRAM that we have on board, which is 8 meg. So, yeah, it doesn't fit. But if we deploy XIP, we are going to use more, uh, more flash because we cannot use uh, compression for the kernel. We cannot use compression for uh, the sections of executables on the root file system uh, that are actually executable. Uh, but still, I mean, we're going to have more flash. We're going to have a lot less RAM used than that. So for the kernel, it will be... 250-something plus dynamic ex dynamic loading, dynamic uh, memory allocation, whatever. It's going to be under 1 meg for, for the root file system, and exactly as for the application, it's going to be around 2 meg. And then we're, uh, we're well under uh, the, the, the RAM size that is used, uh, and we don't have to to use the RAM, which is normally designated for AI, and it's not contiguous, and it sort of has a problem. So we actually do have 6 meg on max demo, plus 2, which we can use, but it's kind of complicated. But we're now under 6, so we're just 
uh, having a happy life out there with XIP. Um, so finally, um, I think it's fair to say that XIP goes very well with uh, RISC-V designs with what they have to offer. And it does allow to reduce design costs and power consumption uh, for RISC-V targets, uh, especially when we talk about IoT designs. And finally, well, it's a bit of a bold statement, but still XIP technology does enable Linux uh, for low cost uh, edge computing designs because otherwise, in most cases, it would just not be possible. Okay, thanks for your attention, that's it. Yeah, questions? Yeah, team has a question. Yeah. Or okay. There's whatever. one question from the virtual crowd, if I could ask it, and sure. the question is, are you assuming network capability is available on the end device? What about networking capability in the lot device? And the last one is, any recommendations if the design model supports having the NIC on the broker? Mm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not sure I got all, all the question. Could you please repeat that? Sure, how about, the, we'll start with the first one. Are you assuming network capability is available on the end device? Um, yeah, yeah. For for the situation when we um, when we use cloud, it's it, it should be available. Uh, the thing is that uh, it might be unavailable uh, at some points, so we we don't uh, we don't assume it's available all the time. Okay. What about? Um, what about networking capability in the LOT device? IOT device? Sorry, I am not a technical person. <laughs> I, think, I think the question no. is whether the kernel image has networking drivers. Can that affect the size? Uh, I'm going to guess that the question is: are, are, Does the is, is the is there a networking driver and stack in your kernel size for the? It sounds like it is. If you yes, okay, yes, th there is a networking stack, but um, it's, it's it's not it's not a big. It's a relatively small one, for instance, because we we don't we don't incorporate uh, in this example we don't incorporate uh, 80211, for instance, because uh, makes the allows for. Um, for the ESP to be plugged on top of it, uh, which has all the Wi-Fi stacks and everything. Right. So we, we don't have to bother about it. So, so there is a networking stack, but it, it limits to, to Ethernet, more or less. Okay, so my, my question uh, is uh, the QSPI NOR, uh, I thought that was slower than RAM. So do you have any benchmark on, uh, is, is it slower than RAM or especially static RAM? So do you have any benchmarking on the, like, is your performance going to suffer uh, and when doing XIP? Uh, static RAM is absolutely, uh, for sure it's faster, but, but there's, there's no alternative of, you know, uh, not, not using QSPR nor flash and, and using static RAM, right? right. Uh, because we, we don't have that much static RAM anyway. So it's, the, the alternative is to either use uh, QSPI NOR for execution or use DRAM for execution. Um, and then they're, they're, they're basically on par for, for those designs because it's not a high-speed DRAM that you would use on those. Um, so as I've said, if, if, it, if it were a DDR4, uh, we would have lost a lot. But, you know, you're not putting a DDR4 uh, on a light bulb that is, you know, uh, uh, somewhere out there, right? Uh, or or a traffic camera, you're not you're not putting a DDR4 out there. So um, it's it's basically on par when it comes to um, the types of dynamic RAM that you use uh, on IoT devices. Yeah, yeah, I think you were the first. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, uh, first of all, I mean, I, I certainly like the XIP uh, idea there. Um, but regarding your demo application where you say, okay, uh, it's better on risk 5 than on uh, 64 than uh, ARM32, um, aren't you, as things stand now, a bit hampered by the fact that risk 5 doesn't have vector extensions, whereas you could use them in ARM? Uh, that's the, I think that's a very valid point. Uh, I, I don't have I don't have the numbers at hand, but it's very it's very application specific. Okay. Um, so, so did you you did not like evaluate the performance of the two platforms against one another? Um, well, let me put it this way: um, you can't you can't evaluate. Uh, an abstract risk 64 versus an abstract arm 32 so there there has to be like a specific risk 84 like k210 like the scan right thing versus uh, uh, i don't know for instance nordic nrf uh, 5340 for instance right so um um if if we take it like this um or, or, or for, for ARM keys, it could be, you know, STM something. Uh, we, we, we did some measurements on Kendrite versus, um, uh, what was that? The Nordic, 5240. Uh, and and Kendrite won uh, with a low margin. Uh, there are STM32 uh, Cortex M7 designs, like 723, 730, all those now new things. Uh, I don't, I, I didn't, didn't do some, the real measurements on those. I think, I think they will overperform um, Kendrite, but they're freaking expensive, okay? Yeah. I mean, I mean, really, they're really expensive. The, the, the Cortex M7 uh, STM parts are really expensive. So okay. they, they start to play in another field, okay? So that's that's the point I'm trying to make. I see. Thank you. And unfortunately, this is the end of the session, but the speaker, I'm sure, can be made, made available and you, got, you all can talk. I just want to give everyone a, if anyone wants to go to break, there's a 30-minute break. Okay. Thank you.